podcaster, I hardly know her. <laughs> Welcome to the I Hardly Know Her podcast, hosted by me, Megan McCaleb. If there's one thing I've learned in this life, it's that I still have a lot to learn. This podcast is your invitation to expand your understanding on all sorts of topics and shake things up a little bit. Listen in and learn something new from the stories, professional insights, and a wide range of expertise shared by me and my incredible guests. And remember, my friends, you don't have to be a big deal to do big things. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the I Hardly Know Her podcast. Today is, uh, I always feel like all my guests are extra special, uh, but my heart is extra big when fellow improvisers are uh, in the, in the same airspace or virtual space, I guess, as it were here. And so we have a really cool opportunity to dive into a topic that is obviously near and dear to my heart. If you've been following me for any amount of time, because improv can bring so much magic into every area of our life, especially in those areas, uh, where we spend a lot of our time in the workplace. So our guest is Kevin Allen. He is a Sarasota, Florida-based improviser, and he is a corporate content leader. He currently works for Discover Financial Services and is a self-proclaimed content nerd. Uh, he's a communications senior manager for the company's business tech division. And prior to that corporate work, he's worked in all sorts of other media elements. Um, he's been a writer for a lot of big name media outlets and really has had his finger on the pulse of how to have empowering messaging, on topics that matter on platforms where people are listening. So this guy knows what he's talking about. And he performs regularly while also teaching improv in the workplace. And that is why I'm so excited to bring him on. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Cool. And of course, with us as always is Jeanette, my wonderful producer and partner in Improv Team Culture. And I want to just like jump right into it. I'm I, I'm super um, energized when I get to talk about why these tools are so helpful. Um, and so I kind of just want to start right there. You're in the corporate space. You get to utilize your improv rules on the regular. Uh, but tell us a little bit about um, your own background in improv and where it has kind of as you've told me before, gone to rest a little bit and then has been revived and is a really helpful thing for your professional career growth. Uh, walk us on your your journey. Sure, sure. So um, so I, I studied theater and uh, and English and, and journalism at uh, uh, in, in college and then was part of a college improv group uh, called Comedy Wars at University of Missouri. And um, I like to say the legendary comedy wars. It's like it's it, it's probably one of the oldest uh, comedy groups outside of like, you know, the lampoons and, and things mm -hmm. like that. But, um, you know, it, it's pretty well known on, on campus. And to this day, I've never performed improvisation in front of more people than I did at, at Mizzou. Um, we would have crowds of like 400 people is crazy. And so I went from that to I, I, I you know, did all the. Did, did all the classes that that I could get my that I could afford in Chicago and then um, you know I, I grew up outside of Chicago and living in the city um, you know you you're kind of balancing career and this extra thing that you do you know with improv and like so many improvisers I uh, who who come to Chicago I eventually felt like I had to pour more of myself into my career which at the time I was working in journalism. I worked for the Chicago Sun Times and ESPN, um, but you know, I always had improv kind of as a side thing. But I never really found my people in Chicago. I never really got to a point where I, you know, felt comfortable where I was getting regular opportunities. It was kind of like, you know, I I, I never poured myself into it to the degree to the degree that that I really needed to to be successful in it, and mm -hmm. so. You know, I, I took a break. I took uh, a hiatus from performing improvisation for several years until uh, my wife and I moved to Sarasota. And uh, they, you know, what I've found since is that, you know, a lot of great improv happens outside of Chicago. And growing up, you kind of know Chicago as like the improv mecca, right? Um, but you know, I've seen in Albuquerque, <laughs> for example, I've seen, uh, you know, Atlanta, Miami, um, I, I've seen in all of these kind of 
other you know fringe cities so to speak that you have just these really innovative improvisers who are doing it for the love and, and building community where they are and that's what really drew me to uh to to start performing again in sarasota is the the incredible community that's been formed around improvisation and because mm -hmm. you know sarasota florida is a destination for retirees it's a multi-generational uh, community. So you have people who are coming into improvisation uh, post career. You're having people come into improvisation who are, you know, mid career, uh, like myself, who are, you know, just professionals and want to get better at public speaking or want to do something to try to meet people. And so it's just this really uh, vibrant, interesting, fun community here. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a rare opportunity to be able to perform every weekend. And, and it's such a joy for me. Yeah, I think that's incredible. And there's so many interesting parallels. Um, like, uh, if people don't know, I find myself educating people kind of often about, as you said, the mecca of improv being in Chicago, and you did do training with like, those premier improv schools, the second city and improv Olympic being a couple of them. Right. And that's where like big name performers come out of like people don't always know that, but the, the path or the track that so many people are on, um, they, they go through that in order to, you know, maybe be on Saturday night live someday or be on all these big types of things. And I remember visiting a lot when I had a day job, I had clients that covered the whole state of Illinois. So anytime I traveled, I would go through Chicago so I could visit some shows. And I, I was blown away by the concept of it because in Boise, Idaho, where I live, we did have kind of this little team of misfits that we would put on our own shows. We briefly, uh, back when I started, had a national level company that came to town and then it fizzled out after about a year. And then we just kind of put some Bambi legs under ourselves and kept going with a troop we came up with back in the day, chicks and giggles. Um, nice. But it, it was interesting for me to see the differences there and to see how, um, I don't know, just the mindset around it. Cause you really do have to be all in. And yet I remember being like, I, one, one guy that I visited there that was telling me at a show, the volume of people that are going through the schooling processes of improv they're like tens of right. thousands is that right that there's it, like yeah i mean in I, the I, greater I, chicago area just like thousands upon thousands of i think when when i was there the the estimate that i would hear people say is that any given time there's between five thousand and ten thousand improvisers okay. in chicago i don't know how accurate that is but it it, it certainly wouldn't surprise me what mm -hmm. i found um what I found almost paradoxical about my time in Chicago was that, you know, here we all were learning this fantastic collaborative art form that depends on you trusting your, your fellow actors. And uh, what I was finding more and more is that because the stakes were a little higher in Chicago and because you had those opportunities to, like you said, move on to Saturday Night Live or move on to writing gigs in, in New York or L.A. or kind of start your own things. It's a place to get noticed. And so, yeah. you know, you you're learning this collaborative art form where you're supposed to have each other's backs and you're supposed to be, you know, very supportive. And yet you have these kind of showcases and opportunities and things where like, um, you know, everyone's suddenly like, uh, it's the me show, you know, and you're like, yeah. oh, okay, well, you know, I, I get that. I get that. Like, you know, you want to make, you want to be seen and make that impact. But, um, you know, the people that I know that did really well are the people that, that did really well, meaning like they've gone on to, to great careers in, in entertainment. Yeah they were they were staunch supporters of the art form you know they yeah. were they were they were students of the art form they took it dead seriously they but also had fun with it right they yeah. worked hard and and they also you know lived the lived the principles i would say and um you know in the end for me i just didn't i didn't have the stomach for rejection i didn't have the stomach for the competition of it and oh. uh, you know so it writing for me and being and throwing myself into journalism that was a lifelong goal you know it mm -hmm. wasn't really until i was in my teens and then early 20s that i started 
getting gaining an interest in theater i you know threw it on as an extra major and you know kind of started uh started my journey relatively late and like so it wasn't like i had this innate thing where i was like you know from five years old i was like you know doing make em ups in the kitchen with my like i i, I kind of came into it late <clears throat> and uh but you know found a, a really quick passion for it and yeah. you know found that when i came back to it uh and, and had kind of established this career and then transitioned out of journalism into more of a of a corporate content role and it's you know call it content marketing call it um mm -hmm. brand journalism brand advocacy whatever you want but when i transition into that in into that i really missed having a more creative outlet like granted mm -hmm. i work in a creative field within you know within a a, a non-creative you could argue pursuit a very you know number crunching and and nuts and bolts pursuit but it still wasn't scratching that creative itch that I had established, you know? And yeah. so when I did come back to improv about a little over five years ago and met um, our director, Will Luera, who's just a, a, a well-known eminent uh, director and improviser in his own right. Um, before he came to Sarasota, he was um, artistic director at improv Boston. So, I mean, mm -hmm. he's, you know, he, he, he is uh, a, a phenomenally well-respected director and just starting to learn again, learn the art form again and, and speak that language again and think in that way again is such a powerful thing. And I can, you know, my, my one, I was at, uh, I was working at IBM at the time that I came back into it. Oh. And I remember being in meetings and like feeling like, you know, feeling that feeling like, uh, like you, you know, like, spider-man has the first time that he can like climb on the wall that he like you know you you kind of feel like oh my gosh i have this superpower where like i can express myself so clearly i yeah. can articulate my ideas to the point where like i'm getting everybody i'm getting buy-in from everybody in the room not heads or nodding things like that and you mm -hmm. can start to just i can track directly like where my career really started to take off and not necessarily like you know it's not like i'm you know, the, the head of the company or anything, like, I'm not like, uh, hanging out in the C-suite, but like, I, I started enjoying my work a lot more. And that to me is such a powerful thing to be able to like, take this thing that I do on the side and get a ton of enjoyment out of, yeah. and then apply it to my professional life. Like, are you kidding me? This is great. This is it's so it's been a blast ever since. Yeah, I think that is so amazing and uh, and incredibly relatable. And one of the things that stuck out to me too is that you were talking about working in a job space where it's like it's not really about being super creative. It's about making sure we're meeting numbers and doing certain things that are we're driving business. Blah, blah blah. And yet, so much of that can be enhanced and levels of success that are not even maybe understood until you meet them are enhanced by that creative space plus the mindset around what you have when you have those improv rules i i know for me and i'm i'm curious to see where you take that is like once i knew the rules of improv and i saw how they could work for the good when you're with the people who really are collaborative on stage and not just trying to race to the funny they're focusing on the relationships and really being good listeners and and team players is I would take that energy and it was like I was fueling up on the weekends when I used to do the shows every weekend and then go to my corporate job on Monday. I felt like I was on the charger over the weekend and getting all my my battery revved up and I could see, I really, like you were saying, that's perfect, the spidey senses, right? So what have you seen in your own experience and then like in the space of being able to share these tools with other people how incredibly powerful it is to take these simple principles and truly add value and impact in the areas that seem like the most mundane. Sure. Know. Yeah. I, I think uh, what you said about, you know, kind of recharging the batteries on the weekends, being able to do this hundred percent. And then, you know, getting, having one night, I, I usually teach like one night a week and I'll teach, you know, okay. we it, at, at Florida studio theater where I perform, there's a, there's a six level program that, um, that Will Luera has designed. 
And so some of us will, you know, we'll fit in at, at any level, like one through five, basically. And then Will teaches uh, his a, a form called free form that he developed in level six that, that kind of combines, you know, all things short form and long form and, and kind of, you know, it takes the takes those rules and kind of throws them out a little bit. But, um, you know, just being able to 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 teach improv as well um, has been has been a real joy for me. And it's been a way for me to meet people and meet new friends. Um, the last class that, that I taught, you had there was a, a teacher, a retiree, an attorney, a physical therapist. So, you know, the, you're, you're getting a, a, a real cross section and nobody in the class was like, you know, I want I'm here because I, you know, I, I want to, I want to get in front of Lauren Michaels and I want to get on SNL. <laughs> Everyone was like here because like, Hey, we're here because this is a fun thing to do and a fun way to meet people and connect with people. And so, you know, for me, finding those opportunities to use improvisation to connect people, whether it's, pe whether it's like coworkers, meaning like, you know, as a people leader with my team, sometimes, you know, I, I'll, I'll use in, in tenets of improvisation as a teaching example. A great one is just, you know, when we, uh, there's a tradition for improvisers. Whenever you go on stage, you tap each other on the back and you say, I've got your back. It's just a reminder before you go on stage to say, hey, like I'm here to make you look good and I know that you're here to make me look good. Um, and, you know, things like that, that like, hey, we all have each other's back. So, you know, in the corporate world, a lot of times you get people who are second guessing whether they want to take their PTO, their uh, paid time off, vacation time that they're owed. And my philosophy is always like, it is your vacation time. You have to take it you have to take it. You're not as good at what you do unless you take it. And hey, mm -hmm. we've got your back. You know, little things like that, that, that just mm -hmm. remind people like, hey, I'm here to make you look good. You're here to make me look good. Another one, a saying that I use all the time, uh, whether I'm telling myself or whether I'm saying it out loud to my team is, uh, I like my idea. I love your idea. If you mm -hmm. take that mentality into a corporate setting, then it's immediate, it gets immediate juices flowing. If you come at it with the idea of, I like my idea, I love your idea, and you start to, and everybody has that mentality and everybody starts to kind of dogpile on some of the, on, on how to solve some of these big problems that, that we face uh, in a corporate setting or in any work setting, really, you, you really start to, you, you really start to collaborate so much more effectively. Oh, for sure. Oh my gosh. It's so true. That is like uh, essentially the make each other look good vibe, right? That is one that I always uh, include in my team trainings on top of like some of the initials, obviously core foundations of yes and and such. And helping people understand that like if our main goal is to make each other look good and we know our peers are also doing the same for us, then we all win together. It's like a it's amazing to me and sad and scary and also hopeful when it, there's the, such a volume of people who have like never really heard of these things before. And I think that's what brings me so much joy in the teaching part. I love being on stage and I think even more, I really do love to be where improv hasn't yet been at least that they're aware of, because sometimes people are natural improvisers and truly we're all improvising every day anyway, right? Right. Bringing it back to like our core uh, uh, functioning space of being a human. That's what we have to do is we have to exactly. make decisions. We have to be ready for something to change no matter how well we try to plan our days. Um, and it's just so empowering and it just, like, I don't know if you see, I'm sure you see this when you have like your your group of all those different industries that you're talking about. Talk to me about like the dynamic of what they, how they enter the room versus how they leave the room. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, there's, uh, th when I, when I've taught musical improv uh, in, in the past, the, the, my, my favorite lesson to teach is musical improv level one, day one, because, you know, it's by, by showing up to that room, you've already won. If you're a student and you show up to any improv class for the first time, you already won because yeah. you took the first step. You recognize the fact that, hey, this can 
this can do something for me. There's something for me here. Um, and then, but but that musical improv day one, 101, we end that lesson with a with a um an exercise called sing your day, where all we're asking people to do is stand up in front of a group of of perfect strangers, essentially, but you've gotten to know them at least a little bit throughout the course of the class. But, um, you know, I tell people at the beginning of the class, by the end of it, you are going to sing an improvised song. And nobody believes me. They're like, I can't do that. Because maybe they've seen like, you know, the improvised musicals that we put on at Florida Studio Theater, or maybe they've, you know, encountered like Baby Wants Candy in Chicago or something like that. And they're like, you know, I want to learn how that happens. And so I tell them by the end of this class, you will sing an improvised song. And we do this exercise called sing your day, which is just, I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I went into the kitchen and made myself breakfast, you know, whatever it is. It's so it's, it can be just the stupidest, most factual thing, but then you get these little wonderful nuggets. You know, there's the, the, the idea of like truth in comedy comes out where they'll <laughs> sing about something ridiculous. Uh, and then my dog peed on the floor and everybody will laugh and then they'll get that laugh and you'll see just the, the you'll see just like a, a, a brief expression change in them where they get that first laugh, you know, when, when they've done something. So it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, you're just pumping people full of confidence. And so, you know, watching someone come into the room on level one, day one, whether it's musical improv, whether it's, you know, you're, you're just learning, you're learning the art form straight out. It's so cool to be able to see how they go from like, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little trepidatious about this or like, you know, like I, I'm self-conscious about like zip, zap, zap, or like even, you know, playing like name thumper, or like get to know you icebreaker type games, anything like that. And then by, you know, you see those incremental changes, you see those aha moments and and at the end of every class, I like to to just get everybody in a circle and say, did anything feel funky? You know, did it was anything off? Did any you know, did we um, you know, what did we did we tread on any topics that, you know, were uncomfortable to anybody? But I also ask people, did you have any aha moments? Anything that you're like, what is one thing that you're taking out of this room that you didn't bring into it? A piece of knowledge, an aha moment, a feeling anything and never once has anybody not been able to articulate something that they are taking out of the room that they didn't bring in mm -hmm. and that to me is the is where the real joy of teaching improvisation comes because like you know as you know they're like i i'm i i guess i'm i'm almost 20 years into uh being an improviser with a little with a little hiatus in between but um you know after 20 years like i still love to learn i still love to learn about this art oh, form yeah. and like you know i i love to improvise with people who have never done it before and people who have done it who you know who who i admire um because you're always going to learn something and uh you're you it's it's one of those things where you're always going to get better whereas like you know something like golf if i if i go golfing at the end of the day i feel worse than i did at the beginning of the day or if mm -hmm. i play tennis i'm like mm -hmm. gosh i i'm not getting better or pickleball or right. whatever like whatever sport <laughs> i guess the older i get like when i play <laughs> it in the morning i'm worse at it by the end of my time playing it so okay. uh improv Ooh. is the exact opposite of that for me Oh, totally. Okay. Oh, I love that. That actually kind of leads into what I was thinking of asking you anyway. And I, can you think of a time or I guess an example of how you use improv to either get unstuck or get yourself out of a funk or to prevent yourself from like being stuck in a rut? Like what are some ways that you activate it for yourself so that you feel like you get to have those benefits all the time? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, for me, performing is is such a cathartic experience that, um, you know, I, I will say like one of the best ways I've gotten unstuck is by bombing. Um, yeah. And whether it's like <laughs> bombing in a in a in a set or bombing in rehearsal or but like just, you know, the, I think the the mentality there for me is that like you know, everybody carries self doubt, everybody carries like, you know, some degree of imposter syndrome and, and, you know, negative self talk, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so by essentially confirming myself 
my self talk, my 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 uh, my own insecurities and my own kind of uh, imposter syndrome by manifesting like you know the the worst case scenario. Essentially, you yeah. kind of realize, hey, it's not that bad. And like, let's trudge forward. Like, I one of my one of my castmates, Christian, uh, has this great saying. Like, if we have a bad show or something, he says you can't think about it for any longer than it took for it to actually happen. So like if we completely bomb or like I do something stupid on stage or make a bad choice or what I think is a bad choice, mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to think he, you know, he'll, he'll tell me like, you're not allowed to think of it for any longer than it took for it to happen. And it's just such a beautiful way to let it go and move on to the next thing. And so mm -hmm. for me, kind of having, having some sort of like, you know, just getting it out of my system is a great way for me to get unstuck. Mm -hmm. um, I will say like, you know, I'm very fortunate that like as a writer, you know, kind of working on deadline uh, and having worked in daily news, um, you kind of, you're not allowed to have writer's block. You're not allowed to like get stuck. You're not allowed to, you know, you, you're not allowed to have a lapse in creativity. And so, you know, that's, that's a fortunate thing for me to, to have come from that space. Um, it's not to say that I don't still, you know, cause I, I granted, like I'm, I'm well removed from, from that lifestyle, but like, you know, it, it helps me to work at a pace that I think is, is not necessarily, um, the norm in a lot of, uh, in a lot of corporate settings. And, uh, and, and so, you know, in that regard, I kind of lean on my my news training uh, to be like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you just got to plow through and, you know, you act as if until until you get to the point where, you know, you're what you're what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish matches what you're actually doing. Yes. OK, you touched on some things here. I'm like, boy, we could probably just ch chit chat improv the rest <laughs> of the day. Um, it always stands out to me, though, when something comes up around quote unquote, wrong choice or made a bad choice, because ultimately that choice at least teaches us something and we can always learn and grow. And I know this is something I don't know if Jeanette wants to chime in, but I know like this is something that's come up for some things that she's expressed to me, too, about like the importance of making a choice, like mm -hmm. not getting stuck and um, and our listeners might not always know exactly what that means to bomb um, but it can definitely be related to like when we, when we do something where we're like, oh my gosh, did I really just say that? Or did I, why did I do that? You know, some of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Comes in. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of times it, <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of times as an improviser, it's just, you know, you can tie it back to, uh, you weren't listening. Um, a lot of times, uh, yeah. If you're, you know, in a corporate setting where when you bomb in a corporate setting, you like, you know, you don't feel great. You walk out of a room, you don't feel great about a presentation or, you know, you're in a pitch meeting and you feel like, you know, you weren't really connecting with the audience or whatnot. You know, you can sometimes tie that to a lack of preparation or just, you know, chalk it up to, hey, you know, this crowd just isn't into improv or like, hey, this yeah. uh, the, the, the people receive it, you know, these stakeholders receiving this message or you know, just, uh, they're, they're not our people, not, they're not, uh, not receptive to the message for one reason or another. So, yeah, I mean, there's always, there, there's always something you can kind of tie it back to. And it's not always mm -hmm. just like, Hey, I, you know, I played a monkey and I should have played a camel. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I come from the school of thought that the only bad choice is no choice. Um, and I try yep. to, you know, relieve myself of feeling like a failure or imposter when I make a quote unquote bad choice by remembering that at least I gave something, right? I gave something to my partner. I didn't just stand there, didn't acknowledge them, you know, completely denied any reality that was set up between me, my partner and the audience. Um, yeah. And that's like helped me as a improviser, as a trainer, as a teacher to, because people do, they panic and they say, what if I make the wrong choice? Mm -hmm. and it's like that thought is the only wrong choice you could make is right. thinking right. that you could make it because in the time mm -hmm. that you took to think that thought, you're like not moving anything forward. You're not supporting yourself. You're not trusting yourself. You're not trusting your partner. You're not trusting your team, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, we, I, 
I, I love that that's such a universal um, insecurity when it comes to, you know, improvisers who are early in their journey. Uh, and, and my my coaching to them is always anything that happens on stage is exactly what's supposed to happen on stage in an improvised setting. And once you mm -hmm. kind of believe that, then that really releases you from the pressure of making the right choice or, or the wrong choice. And, and you, you know, you kind of you lean on the on the tenets of, of improvisation that we teach. You lean on yes and. You lean on, you know, take your time. You lean on, um, you know, it, don't try to be funny. Um, try to relate. Try to make a connection. Focus on the relationship. And, you know, th these the, these things that, that we teach over and over and over are important for me to hear over and over and over. Because, like, you know, no matter how, no matter how long you've been doing this, you're going to get in your head. Uh, there, you're going to have bad nights. You're going to have unreceptive audiences. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be performing in the wake of some human tragedy or something that, mm. um, where, where, you know, people may or may not be ready to laugh. Some of the most profound and, and, and joyous, uh, shows that we did were coming out of coming out of COVID, and when mm -hmm. the theater was was opening up, the first thing that uh, that Florida Studio Theater was able to get on stage was improvisation. And so, you know, this is you're talking about a, an equity theater with um, five stages, and and the first thing that they were able to do coming back was improv. And man, oh. were those audiences ready to laugh. They were ready. It was like this just like exhalation. And, you know, you we had people coming up to us afterward and just saying, you know, thank you. I needed this. And so, you know, like improvisation has like when I when I tell people like improvisation has the ability to heal, like they'll laugh at me. But I'm like, no, I've seen it. I've been in these rooms where, you mm -hmm. know, people where you know theater lovers and people who love live comedy people who may have been trepidatious about going out in public people who may have you know kind of taken their time getting out maybe this was their first foray out and that wasn't lost on us you know we talked about that quite a bit of like what is our responsibility what is funny now you know where what what isn't funny anymore mm -hmm. and um you know having those conversations to me is like I love nerding out about that stuff. And I love, you know, having those important kind of <laughs> higher level conversations where, where we're really trying to suss out, like, how can we best relate to this audience? That idea is kind of the genesis of improv therapy, which yeah. is improv team cultures um, show that's premiering at the fringe festival in August. Um, yeah. It's the, as Megan so brilliantly and punny put it, um, the laughter math of the trials and tribulations that life puts us through, right? Like what, how can we laugh as a way to heal through the things that all of us go through, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, and what I love, there's so many um, things spinning through my head right now. When I think about like the groundwork that I lay, as soon as I start talking to people in improv or in an improv training, like in the workplace, right. Is, is to get rid of those expectations of that it's just going to be this funny ha ha thing or that they're supposed to be funny that's a common misconception right is most people relate improv to either jazz or comedy and um they will be so nervous because they think they're supposed to be funny and I can't tell you how many times people will come up to me and they're like the jokester in the office and they're like leaning into me saying, oh, I, everyone always tells me how funny I am. And I know immediately that's going to be the least funny person <laughs> in the group. Right. <laughs> no offense right. to those folks. But with, with the point of it is, hey, if you're watching a show and it gets those laughs, it is 100 percent because those people are playing by the rules correctly. They do have each other's back. They are yes anding with fiery fury and they are focusing on the relationship that is forming on the stage it's not about the dumb suggestion that we got right. whatever random boot you know whatever yeah. thing we got from the audience to start the scene and and that really just starts to unfold so quickly in a, a very welcoming and like makes improv feel very accessible to people oh my gosh that's what we're doing is we're forging the relationships in a space of acceptance yeah. instead of stepping on each other with our yeah, but vibes. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, it, you, you brought to mind, I was just in, uh, I, I was just in the UK and had the opportunity to see some improv in London and they were phenomenal. It was a phenomenal night uh, of improv. But what struck me was how, uh, how adept they were, how great they were at taking what ended up being like the most filthy suggestions I had ever, I had ever heard a crowd throw out to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm no prude, but I was looking over being like, you're in public and you're <laughs> shouting these uh, <laughs> obscenities. Out. And like the, uh, to the, the actors, to their credit, they honored every single filthy suggestion, but found a way to relate to each other over mm -hmm. it. They didn't make, they didn't make that, you know, the, the, the audience member always, already gets the laugh from yeah. the, from the ridiculous suggestion, you know, whatever it is. Um, and uh you know the but their ability to then take it and make something sophisticated out of it and something that is a higher art out of it it was it was incredible you know just watching them watching them work through it and watching them connect as actors because like you know as improvisers you kind of you kind of see like you can you can tell on on stage like okay you know the actors are communicating silently and it was kind of this moment of like do we take it? Yep, we do. And then they went with it and it was just brilliant the way that they didn't make it about that joke. Yeah. You know, they didn't, uh, they made it about their relationship with each other. And it was even, you know, they got even more and, and broader and, and more consistent laughs than, than the, the immediate suggestion did, which, you know, got laughs, but you know, and, and I tell people like, you know, when you break a, when you break a rule in improv and, and I use the rule, I use the word rule, like very, loosely and lightly mm -hmm. um but you know the the idea of um the idea of denial of the the no but yeah. um you know i use the example like hey uh you know I'm, I'm so excited to be going to the store with you we're not going to the store we're on a spaceship to mars you will absolutely get a laugh mm -hmm. one laugh and then where are you going because <laughs> you just because you're you just set your you just set your scene partner up to uh look like the crazy person uh and like you've just made them look bad yeah. at, but but you so you got the laugh now what mm -hmm. and then you know seeing seeing actors who are, are very early in their improv journey kind of like do that mental math and realize like oh that's what yes and means it doesn't mean literally saying Yes, and let's get some Fruit Loops. Yes, and let's make sure we have enough oat milk for the Fruit Loops. And yes, and right. but you know, it's not that. It's accept agreeing that hey, I'm going to come up with some ideas, and you're going to accept them and add to them, and you're going to come up with some ideas, and I'm going to accept them and add to them, and and we're going to go back and forth like that, and we're going to back into this thing, and we're gonna we're gonna start really, we're gonna start at this like pinpoint spot, and then. We're going to, with each thing, we're going to get broader and broader and broader and paint a fuller and fuller picture, you know, mm. like, a, like a Bob Ross painting where like, you know, you start <laughs> with a happy little tree and then finally by the end of it, you have this like gorgeous landscape and you have context and you have, you know, like layers and shades. Like, isn't that more fun to create than a, you know, nope, we're on a spaceship. We're actually going to Mars. <laughs> Well, right. you just, oh, yeah. You. yeah. As we're on the home stretch here, I want to cover a couple other thoughts and, and hang out in the, in, uh, yeah, but land. I know it's no, but yeah, but yes, but whatever people say, mm -hmm. I like to call it. Yeah. But yeah. And one of the things that's interesting too, where you're saying they get the laugh when there's something that's absurd, that just gets blurted out. And one of my favorite activities to do with just, you know, regular, and it's mostly like regular people that are in these corporate jobs. And they'll do a yes and round with their partners on a subject of something that they love. And then they do a yeah, but round where they just have a simple conversation. And what I love to point out in those is that in both rounds, there is always laughter. There is always different body language things that are happening. And to point out the difference in the type of laughter because mm -hmm. we do laugh sometimes when things are awkward or there's shock value or it's unexpected, right? And so there's like pros and cons in those spaces. And when people are recognizing that, and then sometimes I, I watch, you know, like I mentioned the guy, the guy that's like, I'm the funniest guy in the room right. to watch them process it and even see 
either one of two things happens. They become aware of it and they go, oh, and they realize, oh, like sarcasm hangs out in yeah, but land, like the punching mm -hmm. down, like those things that are still funny, haha. -ha, they're just not connecting us versus look how much power is in focusing. Like we've talked about on this already, the relationship first. And then those funny things come because they're so yummy and relatable. Right. And yeah, so you just, there's so many things in that space. And I, I'm curious what advice or, or guidance would you give someone who is a no butter or a yeah butter? And they, they either that, I don't know. It's like, there may, I know there's listeners out there who are just hearing some of these things kind of for the first time or hearing it in the right way that will click for them. How do we guide people to be aware of their yeah, but tendencies so that we can help them remove their own blocks? Is that too, too intense? I've had, I've had a few, uh, I, I've worked with a few folks over the years who have kind of, you know, who, who have kind of held on to this, like, you know, my, my friends and family tell me I'm hilarious. And so I wanted mm -hmm. to take some improv to get some of these ideas out, out there. And, um, you know, what I try to do is to, is to, is to make them, is to make them uncomfortable and, and to say, uh, all right, this is a serious scene. No laughter. If you laugh, you're out. You know, <laughs> like if you, Ooh. if you laugh, we, we ding the bell and we start over. Um, so, you know, that like from an exercise, I, from an advice standpoint, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I would say like the 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 best advice i could give is just the, it, it takes practice it, it's a muscle like anything else like you know it's a way of thinking that that a lot of us aren't necessarily used to and yeah. so you know read books about improvisation i just read uh dave rosowski's book um i the name escapes me right now but um you know his his idea is all about uh you know training actors who improvise rather than improvisers who who make people laugh mm -hmm. so you know if, if you can if if you can approach improvisation like an actor would approach a role like an actor would prepare mm -hmm. um when you do that it's much more powerful it's much more impactful um you know if, if you can mix if, if you can find play the truth of an emotion play the truth of a scene um the way that really uh the, the way that translates in a, in a corporate setting to me is much more beyond uh going 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 much more beyond just the the surface saying mm. all right why are we wh why are we implementing this strategy what problems do you have like wh why are why is this strategy not connecting with you why are you having trouble executing against this vision and what blockers can we remove and and you know really getting to the truth to the core of of those problems that you're trying to solve because like you know as improvisers we're trying to solve a problem too we've got a group of people in front of us that probably paid to be there that are, are looking for uh, a theater piece that has never been performed and will never be performed again. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, we, you, you come at it from a problem solving standpoint. And, and if you're all on the same page, kind of rowing in that same yes and boat, um, then you're, you know, you, you've, you're already leagues ahead of your competitors. Um, and thank you for, for dropping Dave's book. It's a subversive's guide to improvisation moving beyond yes. And, but, uh, okay. it's a ph phenomenal book. And, and Dave has, uh, actually come down and, and taught some at uh, Florida studio theater. I know he's world renowned teacher. And, uh, I, uh, I came across him a couple of times in Chicago and it was always a kind of a, a little thrill for my improv nerd brain. I love it. That's so cool. This has been so fun to have you on. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your insights and the clarity you have in how powerful these tools are. Um, as we wrap up here, I want to talk a little bit about your upcoming, you're working on a book. That's yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Actually, so cool. I'm, I we support you in this quest yeah. of uh, authorship. So I have, I, I, I've been the beneficiary of, um, you know, it, it, the, the, improvisation coming in and teaching me so much about how to relate to people how to um how, how to get by and, and how to be seen and heard in uh in a corporate setting and you know I, I've, I've learned a lot along the way learned a lot of what to do and what to avoid and uh so you know this uh this piece that i'm writing is a, a 
a modern professional's guide to improvisation. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is tell people stories, um, you know, give a few tips, give some exercises that uh, people leaders like myself can uh, can easily do with their teams to, you know, kind of drive those creative juices and, and get them connecting with each other more. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm looking to speak with people who, like me, have kind of gone through and, um, you know, used improvisation as a way to help themselves uh, become better in a professional setting. So I'm very findable on LinkedIn. You can search yeah. for Kevin Allen and uh, I'm, I'm one of the first ones to come up. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd love to connect with anybody who's had a similar experience and 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 chat about that uh you know I'm, I'm hoping to i'm hoping to get something published by the end of the year but we'll see it's you know like it's we all we all get so busy that it's like yeah. you know these passion projects that kind of live on the sidelines where constantly like you know it's it's mo it mostly lives in my in the notes on in the notes app on my phone uh mm. but it will eventually live on on real paper and nice. uh and yeah they say the joy of uh, there is no joy in writing, only having written. I think that was maybe Dorothy Parker said some some much more eloquent version of that, but um, that's definitely my experience. <laughs> well, I'm sure it will unfold in exactly the perfect timing that it is supposed to. Awesome. Um, it has been most excellent spending some time with you here on the podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. And we'll definitely make sure that contact information is there in the show notes so that people can reach out to you as well. Awesome. And Thanks so much for having me. This is a blast. I love talking about this stuff. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you again soon. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the I Hardly Know Her podcast. For information about leadership workshops, public speaker training, and all things kooky Megan, check out improvteamculture.com. We'll catch you next time.